from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome Kate the Great, otherwise known as Kate DiCamillo, to the stage! How are y'all doing? Um, I, um, I have a speech, um, but a speech always makes me feel um, kind of like I'm lecturing people. And what I love to do is, is to talk with y'all. So uh, a couple of years ago, I came to the National Book Festival, and I threatened everybody with a speech. And then I, and then I said, how many of y'all want to hear the speech? And like two hands went up. Um, and so I'm going to do that again. Uh, how many people want to hear the speech? Well, that's better than two. It makes me feel a little bit better. And how many, uh, we don't have a ton of time, so how many people would like to do uh, Q&A, which, uh, and, and who has questions? The other thing that we can do in our short amount of time is I can read to y'all. Um, and I don't do, yeah, so that would be kind of fun. Um, the only thing is I would need to borrow somebody's book. So, oh, what have you got? You've got, you want to do Rainy Nightingale? Have you, has anybody read Rainy Nightingale? You're, you're, uh, you have, that's good. Okay, I'm gonna borrow your book. Thank you very much, what's your name? Riley. Riley, is it R-I-L-E-Y? Yeah. Thank you, Riley, I'll give it back, probably. Um, so, uh, Rainy Nightingale is um, my most recent novel and it uh, takes place in Central Florida in the mid-70s and um, I grew up in Central Florida in the mid-70s. And when I was doing all the pre-publicity before this book came out, one of the very first interviews that I did, uh, uh, the person said, so this is, it's mid-70s, so it's historical fiction, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I guess it is historical fiction. So uh, I'm gonna read to you from a book of historical fiction. Um, and this is chapter one. There were three of them three girls. They were standing side by side. They were standing at attention. And then the girl in the pink dress, the one who was standing right next to Ramey, let out a sob and said, the more I think about it, the more terrified I am. I'm too terrified to go on. The girl clutched her baton to her chest and dropped to her knees. Ramey stared at her in wonder and admiration. She herself often felt too terrified to go on, but she had never admitted it out loud. The girl in the pink dress moaned and toppled over sideways. Her eyes fluttered closed. She was silent, and then she opened her eyes very wide and shouted, Archie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I betrayed you. She closed her eyes again. Her mouth fell open. Ramey had never seen or heard anything like it. I'm sorry, Ramey whispered. I betrayed you. For some reason, the words seemed worth repeating. Stop this nonsense immediately, said Ida Nee. Ida Nee was the baton twirling instructor, even though she was old, over 50 at least. Her hair was an extremely bright yellow. She wore white boots that came all the way up to her knees. I'm not kidding, said Ida Nee. Ramey believed her. Ida Nee didn't seem like much of a kidder. The sun was way, way up in the sky, and the whole thing was like high noon in a western. But it was not a western. It was baton twirling lessons at Ida Nee's house in Ida Nee's backyard. It was the summer of 1975. It was the fifth day of June. And two days before, on the third day of June, Rainey Clark's father had run away from home with a woman who was a dental hygienist. Hey, diddle, diddle, the dish ran away with the spoon. Those were the words that went through Rainey's head every time she thought about her father and the dental hygienist. But she did not say the words out loud anymore because Rainey's mother was very upset and talking about dishes and spoons running away together was not appropriate. It was actually a great tragedy what had happened. That was what Rainey's mother said. This is a great tragedy, said Rainey's mother. Quit reciting nursery rhymes. It was a great tragedy because Ramey's father had disgraced himself. It was also a great tragedy because Ramey was now fatherless. The thought of that, the fact of it, that she, Ramey Clark, was without a father, 
made a small, sharp pain shoot through Ramy's heart every time she considered it. Sometimes the pain in her heart made her feel too terrified to go on. Sometimes it made her want to drop to her knees. But then she would remember that she had a plan. I'm going to read you about the plan. Chapter 2. Get up, said Ida Nee to the girl in the pink dress. She fainted, said the other baton twirling student, a girl named Beverly Topinski, whose father was a cop. Ramey knew the girl's name and what her father did because Beverly had made an announcement at the beginning of the lesson. She stared straight ahead, not looking at anybody in particular, and said, my name is Beverly Topinski, and my father's a cop, so I don't think you should mess with me. Ramey, for one, had no intention of messing with her. I've seen a lot of people faint, said Beverly now. That's what happens when you're the daughter of a cop. You see everything. You see it all. Shut up, Topinski, said Ida Nee. The sun was very high in the sky. It hadn't moved. It seemed like someone had stuck it up there and then walked away and left it. I'm sorry, whispered Ramey. I betrayed you. Beverly Topinski knelt down and put her hands on either side of the fainting girl's face. What do you think you're doing, said Ida Nee. The pine trees above them swayed back and forth. The lake, Lake Clara, where someone named Clara Wingtip had managed to drown herself a hundred years ago, gleamed and glittered. The lake looked hungry. Maybe it was hoping for another Clara Wingtip. Ramey felt a wave of despair. There wasn't time for people fainting. She had to learn how to twirl a baton, and she had to learn fast, because if she learned how to twirl a baton, then she stood a good chance of becoming Little Miss Central Florida Tire. And if she became Little Miss Central Florida Tire, her father would see her picture in the paper and come home. That was Ramey's plan. Um, Riley, thank you for letting me borrow that very, very much. I appreciate that. I'm on a cord here. Um, who's, does anybody have a copy of uh, Because of Winn-Dixie, which is the first book that I uh, wrote? That's your favorite? What if I just, it's kind of like a way to book in things. That was the most recent book I, I wrote was Ramey, and the first one was Because of Winn-Dixie. What if we read the first chapter of Because of Winn-Dixie? Yes, so can I borrow somebody's book again? I, I, I was talking to a group of first graders not that long ago, and I got into an argument with one of the first graders about something that happened in this book. Thank you. What's your name? Neve. Neve? Thank you. Um, and uh, I was wrong and this first grader was right. Um, so it's like all of which is to say I don't remember it as well as I should. Um, this book came out in um, 2000 and um, I was working at a bookstore when it was published and before that I had worked at a book warehouse and so I had a very realistic goal for what would happen with a middle grade novel from a first time novelist. I thought if I'm really, really lucky, 5,000 copies of this book will sell, which will then let me earn out my advance and, and, and maybe I'll be lucky enough to write another book. And whatever didn't sell I would hoped would be like remaindered in Guatemala where I wouldn't have to see it every day at work, you know? <laughs> And so what has happened with Because of When Dixie defied the biggest dreams I had ever had in the world. And um, so many of you I know know this book, so I just want to say thank you because it, it, this book was passed from hand to hand and um, all of y'all let me get to stand up here and do this and it's like the best job in the world. So, um, okay, chapter one. My name is India Opal Bologna, and last summer my daddy, the preacher, sent me to the store for a box of macaroni and cheese, some white rice, and two tomatoes, and I came back with a dog. This is what happened. I walked into the produce section of the Winn-Dixie grocery store to pick out my two tomatoes, and I almost bumped right into the store manager. He was standing there all red-faced, screaming and waving his arms around. Who let a dog in here? He kept on shouting. Who let a dirty dog in here? At first, I didn't see a dog. There were just a lot of vegetables rolling around on the floor, tomatoes and onions and green peppers. And there was what seemed like a whole army of Winn-Dixie employees running around, waving their arms, just the same way the store manager was waving his. And then the dog came running around the corner. He was a big dog and ugly. And he looked like he was having a real good time. His tongue was hanging out and he was wagging his tail. He skidded to a stop 
and smiled right at me. I had never before in my life seen a dog smile, but that is what he did. He pulled back his lips and showed me all his teeth. Then he wagged his tail so hard that he knocked some oranges off a display, and they went rolling everywhere, mixing in with the tomatoes and onions and green peppers. The manager screamed, somebody grab that dog. The dog went running over to the manager, wagging his tail and smiling. He stood up on his hind legs. You could tell that all he wanted to do was get face to face with the manager and thank him for the good time he was having in the produce department. But somehow he ended up knocking the manager over and the manager must have been having a bad day because lying there on the floor, right in front of everybody, he started to cry. The dog leaned over him real concerned and licked his face. Please, said the manager, somebody call the pound. Wait a minute, I hollered. That's my dog, don't call the pound. All the Wim Dixie employees turned around and looked at me, and I knew I had done something big and maybe stupid too, but I couldn't help it. I couldn't let that dog go to the pound. Here, boy, I said. The dog stopped licking the manager's face and put his ears up in the air and looked at me like he was trying to remember where he knew me from. Here, boy, I said again. And then I figured that the dog was probably just like everybody else in the world, that he would want to get called by a name, only I didn't know what his name was. So I just said the first thing that came into my head, I said, here, Winn-Dixie. And that dog came trotting over to me, just like he'd been doing it his whole life. The manager sat up and gave me a hard stare like maybe I was making fun of him. It's his name, I said, honest. The manager said, don't you know not to bring a dog into a grocery store? Yes, sir, I told him. He got in by mistake. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. Come on, Winn-Dixie, I said to the dog. I started walking and he followed along behind me as I went out of the produce department and down the cereal aisle and past all the cashiers and out the door. Once we were safe outside, I checked him over real careful, and he didn't look that good. He was big but skinny. You could see his ribs, and there were bald patches all over him, places where he didn't have any fur at all. Mostly, he looked like a big piece of old brown carpet that had been left out in the rain. You're a mess, I told him. I bet you don't belong to anybody. He smiled at me. He did that thing again where he pulled back his lips and showed me his teeth. He smiled so big that it made him sneeze. It was like he was saying, I know I'm a mess, isn't it funny? It's hard not to immediately fall in love with a dog who has a good sense of humor. Come on, I told him, let's see what the preacher has to say about you. And the two of us, me and Wendy Dixie, started walking home. Um, where are you? You're a very helpful person, thank you. Okay, who's going to ask me questions? Thank you so much. Yes. What inspired me to write Because of Win dixie So um, I grew up in Central Florida, and uh, when I was 30 years old, I moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, do, do, you, do you know kind of like what winters are like in Minneapolis, Minnesota? Any idea? The second winter that I was there, the high temperature for three days in a row was 37 degrees below zero. So if you're a girl who grew up in central Florida and it's 37 degrees below zero, where would you like to be? I would, well, in the library, yes, but I, would, I wanted to go home. I wanted to go back to Florida. I could not afford to go back home. Um, but I could write a book that would take me home. Also, it was the first time in my life that I'd been uh, without a dog. And uh, I was experiencing what I call dog withdrawal. So like if I was in a car and there was a dog in the car next to me, I would beat my horn and wave at the dog. Um, I couldn't have a dog in the apartment where I was living, so I just made up the best dog that I could think of. And that was when dixie And so that's where the book came from, although I didn't know at the time um, that, that I just knew that I needed a dog and I knew I wanted to go home. So those two things. So should we move to the mics now? Do you want to do that? Yes. What inspired Ulysses to be sucked up by a vacuum? <laughs> so Flora and Ulysses um, is, uh, anybody know that book? Um, the story, oh, that's great. Okay, so it's the story of a girl 
and a squirrel and also a vacuum cleaner. So where did the inspiration to get, the, the squirrel is sucked up into a vacuum cleaner and turned into a superhero, it's a true story. So where did I get, where did I get the inspiration? It's, this is, uh, unfortunately there's no fast way to do this, but I'll try to do it quickly. My mother passed away in uh, 2009 and she had a vacuum cleaner, an Electrolux vacuum cleaner that she thought was the best thing in the world. And in the last year of her life, she would turn to me periodically and say, what's gonna happen to the vacuum cleaner when I'm gone? And I would always say, I'll take the vacuum cleaner. Don't worry about the vacuum cleaner. So my mom passed away. I did as I promised. I took the vacuum cleaner. But my mom had a cat, the world's most evil cat named Mildew. And I am allergic to cats. And so when I got the vacuum cleaner, it was filled with mildew hair. And so I couldn't bring it into the house. And I, I put it in the garage. And uh, every time I pulled into the garage, there was the vacuum cleaner. And it made my heart hurt. It made me miss my mother. So the spring after my mother died, there was a squirrel who was on the front steps of my house who was clearly in some distress. And uh, I didn't know what to do for him. He was draped dramatically over the steps and he wouldn't move when I got close to him, but he was still breathing. And I called one of my best friends who lives a block and a half away from me and who has asked me never to say her name when I tell this story. Um, but she really, truly is the kindest and gentlest of all my friends. But when I called her and said, there's a squirrel dying on my front steps, what should I do? Carla said, do you have a shovel? And uh, I said, sure, I have a shovel. She said, get an old t-shirt, get the shovel. I will come over there and whack him over the head. <laughs> That's what she said. I was on the cell phone. I was very close to the squirrel. I didn't want him to overhear the bloody words that she had just spoken. So I'm like backing up away from the squirrel. I go in the side door, look out the front door. Guess what? The squirrel's gone. He's like, oh no, not me. I'll find a different way to die. And so, but the whole incident made me think about uh, an E.B. White essay, uh, Death of a Pig. And um, E.B. White said, when he uh, wrote Charlotte's Web, he was thinking about ways to save a pig's life. So I started to think about ways to save a squirrel's life. And I combined it with that vacuum cleaner. And not only did I save the squirrel's life, but I had the squirrel sucked up into the vacuum cleaner and turned into a superhero who could write poetry. And that's where that came from. So, whew, I wish it was shorter, but it's not. Okay, over here, please. Where what? did, um, how did you get the inspiration for the title, Ramy Nightingale? Where did I get the inspiration for the title, Ramy Nightingale? Well, I don't want to totally say it because it gives away something that happens at the very end of the book, um, uh, where, um, where Ramy does something that she, ha she, she didn't think that she could do. And, and so it's like the, the title is a combination, it, it, it kind of like captures that idea of that thing that there's something, there's a power inside all of us that we don't know is there. And so that's what I wanted in the title. Did you have some thoughts on the title? I think it was a really good title. That's exactly the kind of thought I love to hear. Yes, <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Okay, yes. Um, and because of when Dixie, oh. That makes me You're good, yeah. It, it just makes you sound powerful, like the Wizard of Oz, yes. And because of Winn-Dixie, there's this candy that makes people sad. Mm -hmm. That part almost made me cry. But um, is that an actual candy? So, and, and because of Winn-Dixie, there's the litmus lozenges that make you feel kind of uh, sad and happy at the same time, melancholy. Do they actually exist? They do not. And I would like you to imagine um, the last person that I talked to in line at a bookstore in Michigan who was the parent of a child um, who was doing a report on Because of Winn-Dixie and, and she was like, I need to find these candies immediately for this child's report. And it's like, where are they? And it's like, they don't exist. And she was not happy with me. But that's the great thing about writing stories is that you can, anything can happen. You can, you can make things up, yes. Uh, so we're together. Okay, and it, is it one question or two? Yeah. Yes, one. okay. So, um, we really like reading when Dixie. Yeah, and we were wondering, which one did you have the most fun writing? Oh, that's a good question. So, 
They really like reading Winn-Dixie. Which one did I have the most fun writing? Can I tell you something? Yeah. Writing is so hard for me. The word fun is not really uh, appended to it ever for me. Uh, there's a great uh, writer, Dorothy Parker, who said, I hate writing. I love having written. Does that make sense to you? So it's always like I always kind of have to force myself to do it. I'm always kind of afraid. Um, and I don't, uh, a lot of times I don't know how the story is going to work out. Usually I don't. But probably the easiest one for me to write was a book called uh, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. Um, does, so raise your hand if you know that. Oh, that's great. And that book kind of, um, it wrote itself. And, it, and I did it, and usually when I write a novel, it's eight or nine drafts. I did that one in, in four drafts. It just, it just wrote itself. Um, adults, y'all can ask questions too. Um, you don't have to, yes? What inspired Flora? What inspired Flora? Well, I have to say that, so Flora and Flora and Ulysses is a comic book reading cynical child. And uh, I uh, loved to read everything, including comic books when I was a kid and still as an adult. Um, and. I am what a friend of mine once called me a perky curmudgeon. So I think that I think that that cynicism of Flora's is mine. But there's a wonderful saying about cynics: you scratch the surface and you find a romantic underneath of a cynic. So, yes. Um. Uh, Don't panic. How did you get the idea for the tale of Despero? Tale of Despero. So uh, raise your hand if you know the story of a mouse who. You guys are a well-read crowd, I tell you what. So where did the idea come from for Tale of Despero? Um, so I had written Because of Winn-Dixie. And uh, uh, as I said, what happened with that book surprised me mightily. And uh, um, it had just been published. And there it was, a book with my name on the spine and on the cover. And I went to see my best friend. Uh, she was living in St. Louis at the time, and her son, his name is Luke Bailey, he was eight years old, a huge reader. He had um, never been impressed with me before, but all of a sudden, here I was with my name on a book. So everywhere I went that visit, Luke followed me around. And at the end of the visit, he asked if he could have a private word with me in his room. So we went into his room, and I sat down, and he said, I've got an excellent idea for a book. And I said, what is it? He said, it's the story of an unlikely hero with exceptionally large ears. And I said, what happens to the hero? And he said, I don't know. That's why I want you to write the book. And so he didn't say a mouse, but I, I thought a mouse was the most unlikely hero I could think of. And by the time the book was published and then uh, won the Newbery, Luke was 14 years old, and I made him come to this banquet where they present the award. It's a 1,000 librarians. It's fabulous. I made Luke come to that wearing a tie. I made him stand up in front of all those people. Everybody said, oh, you must be so proud and excited, Luke. And he was 14 years old, so uh, not really. But um, he's a history teacher now, and he's working on a novel. So yeah, Luke Bailey, yes. I only have two minutes. Um, OK, yes, over here, yes. What, what was, was your, your favorite, favorite book, book as a kid? My favorite book as a kid? One favorite book? Wait, you all have to answer it. What's your favorite book? Uh. See? Imagine like standing up on a stage and having somebody ask you that. It's like, can you do it? Because of Winn-Dixie. Well, that's a, a, a very uh, diplomatically brilliant answer, I would say, yeah. Uh, and you? Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a very good answer, too. Um, I can never pick just one favorite book uh, ever, not as an adult, not as a kid. I love to read as a kid. I love to read as an adult. I, if you force me, I will say uh, Charlotte's Web by E.B. White, even though I didn't read it as a kid because I read Black Beauty as a kid. And after that, I would never check out another book with an animal on the cover. And I would look at uh, Wilbur's face in the spin rack at the library and think, oh no, not me. Something terrible is going to happen to that pig. So I didn't read it until I was an adult. But to my mind, that is one of the most perfect books ever written. How many of y'all have read Charlotte's Web? Yeah. How many teachers in, in, the, in, the, in the audience? 
How many of you teachers read out loud to your kids during, can we have a round of applause for, uh, whoops, I cannot, I cannot tell you, oh, wrap it up, I gotta wrap it up. I cannot tell you how much that matters. I was a kid who grew up in a house filled with books with a mother who read to me, bought me books, took me to the library. I lived for Mrs. Boyette to read aloud for me every day after lunch, Island of the Blue Dolphins, I will never forget it. You are, you're changing lives when you read out loud. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for believing in the power of stories. I'm so grateful, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.